my fro and egg. Ja, ja. My fro and egg, fruitful in the name of Jesus Christ, on the loser. What language was I speaking? Afrikaans. And the people said, amen. Now, would you like to know what you amen? amen. I said, in a traditional African greeting, my wife and I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it is interesting how things work together, how God and the Holy Spirit put things together. Who's the young man who told us about David Livingston? Raise your hand. There he is. Yeah. Liz and I have stood on the same ground that David Livingston walked on. We have been in the prayer garden at the Moffat Mission in Kimberley, South Africa, where he proposed to Mary who became his wife. It's the same place where he recovered from the lion attack. Um, and it was the Moffats uh, started that mission. They preceded him, uh, by I, I guess you would say by a generation, because he married one of their daughters. And uh, then we also had the privilege of standing in an area and looking into, well, yeah, looking into an old, old, old stone church that he had actually preached in. And there, I can't remember the significance of the tree in there, but something happened with, between David and somebody at, underneath that tree that we, the tree is now dead, but the stump is there. <laughs> but it's, it still has a plaque on it. And uh, uh, we've been inside the, uh, the main, uh, the, 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 main worship building at the Moffat Mission Station. It's now a, a park, but it's a functioning park. They still have church at the Moffat Mission. So I just thought that that was interesting that you would ex tell us about David Livingston, and we have been where David Livingston was. So. Yes, we are. <laughs> Um, yes, we did spend uh, nine years with the International Mission Board. We were assigned to South Africa. Uh, the way they do things in the International Mission Board nowadays is, uh, yes, I ha you have to go to a country because that's the way the world's organized, but we weren't missionaries to South Africa. We were missionaries to a particular people group within South Africa. They were an Afrikaans-speaking people group, but they were not the white Afrikaners. They were a mixed race people that uh, uh, grew up after the Dutch settled um, South Africa, way back almost the time the pilgrims settled our country. Very close together in proximity there. But the two histories are so totally different in, as, they, as the two nations develop. I'll leave that to your own curiosity. Um, you'll soon find out I'm a teacher by profession, not a preacher. <laughs> so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to treach, okay? I just made that up, by the way. <laughs> but when you're on the mission field, and some of you can identify with what I'm about to say, you don't you can't always do things the way you do them back home, okay? Uh, and that's one thing we found out very quickly when we went overseas, that we couldn't conduct church, so to speak, in the same manner that we conducted it over here. For one thing, where we were, we didn't have any buildings. Now that does not mean that there are no church buildings in South Africa. South Africa is, pardon the phrase, littered with church buildings. <laughs> a church on every corner almost. Um, unfortunately, most of them have a, either wrong doctrine or something. But um, 
But where we lived, we were placed specifically in the town where we went to because there was no viable, strong uh, Baptist presence in that town. And we, we served there six years. And unfortunately, that's pretty much the way we left it after six years. <laughs> no viable, but strong Baptist work. <laughs> but that's what you do. However, and my wife's back there giving me a cue. Um, <laughs> uh, even though we were church planting missionaries to a specific people group, and they were our focus, there are other people that we came in contact with. And one of those types of people, groups of people, but not a people group, okay, was immigrants from other parts of Africa, from uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, from Burundi, from um, um, Zambia, and some of those areas that had migrated down mostly for jobs because South Africa is so advanced in that respect. But in the context of that, and having a team of college students come over to visit us for 16 days in uh, uh, LSU students come over from the BSU. They met a young man, or, and, which led to a meeting of a group of people, but um, we did have a church start. God started the church and, it, and it just dropped it in our lap. And um, there is now a viable Baptist church in the town of Uppington and it is growing as we understand it even now and it started back in 2010 when we were there but as God would have things it wasn't the people group we were working with <laughs> but there is a church there now okay one of the things that, that we learned quickly over there and I'm getting into the message honest I am uh, uh, <laughs> uh, was that I, I said it before you can't necessarily do things the way you did them over there and we had to learn and adapt to teaching and preaching in the way that they could reproduce it and so you end up doing your work with very few quotes resources okay uh, so this is basically the kind of way that we would have presented a message to them. I mean, I've got my Bible up here, okay? And what the message is coming from this Bible, literally. But I'm not going to be reading from the Bible. Well, I am going to be reading from the Bible, but what I'm saying is I have it on paper. So I may not look like I'm, you know, the, 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 the preacher type walking around, you know, I don't know what he does. So. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is we had to adapt. And it's, it, uh, and, and make do with what we had. Um, so here goes. Uh, it's titled, Who is this man? And what I would like to do is, is basically teach you a lesson the same way I would over there. Okay. So let me introduce you to someone whose name is Jesus. He, there are three things at least. Okay, There are three things from the Bible that I want you to know about Jesus. There are mo many more things, but these are the three I want you to know this morning. I want you, and I'm going to read scripture to you. Uh, and from these scripture passages that I read, we're going to learn some things about Jesus. So I want to, I want to read this story from the Bible. And it, it, uh, the background is he had been in the location and he had been teaching the people. And evening came and they said, he said to them, let's go over across the lake. So that evening, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they, they took Jesus along in a boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A violent windstorm came up. The waves were breaking into the boat so that it was quickly filling up. 
But he was sleeping on a cushion in the back of the boat. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? Then he got up, ordered the wind to stop, and said to the sea, Be still, absolutely still. The wind stopped blowing and the sea became very calm. He asked them, why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith yet? They were overcome with fear and asked each other, say it, who is this man? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Now another story. One day, when Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and experts in Moses' teaching were present. They had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. Jesus had the power of the Lord to heal. Some men brought a paralyzed man on a stretcher. They tried to take him into the house and put him in front of Jesus, but they could not find a way to get him into the house because of the crowd. So they went up on the roof, they made an opening in the tiles and let the man down on his stretcher among the people. They lowered him in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Sir, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees thought, say it for me, who is this man? He's dishonoring God. Who besides God can forgive sins? Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he said to them, What are you thinking? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your stretcher, and go home. The man immediately stood up in front of them and picked up the stretcher he had been lying on. Praising God, he went home. Everyone was amazed and praised God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen things today we can hardly believe. And a third story. One of the Pharisees, and this is a different location, different setting now. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and was eating at the table. A woman who lived a sinful life in that city found out that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she took a bottle of perfume and knelt at his feet. She was crying and washed his feet with her tears then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them over and over again, and poured the perfume on them. The Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this and thought, If this man really were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus spoke up. Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon replied, Teacher, you're free to speak. So Jesus said, Two men owed a moneylender some money. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other owed him 50. When they couldn't pay it back, he was kind enough to cancel their debts. Now, who do you think will love him the most? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. Jesus said to him, You are right. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, You see this woman, don't you? I came into your house. You didn't wash my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't put any olive oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. That's why I'm telling you that her many sins have been forgiven. Her great love proves that. But whoever receives little forgiveness loves very little. Then Jesus said to her, 
Your sins have been forgiven. The other guests thought. Who is this man who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The stories illustrate three events in Jesus' life that caused people to ask that question. Who is this man? I mean, can't you just picture that? Like, who is this man? The first event illustrates Jesus' control over the natural forces of the earth. He calmed the wind. He calmed the sea. Okay? He can control nature. The second event, the healing of the paralytic, and the third event, the forgiving of the sinful woman, concern his control over the spiritual forces that work in a person's life. So what... It all leads up to is who is this man that can do these kind of things? Control nature, control the spiritual forces working in a human's life, heal people. Sounds to me like a man for all seasons. Is that, you kind of get that idea? People have been asking this question, who is Jesus, ever since he walked on the face of the earth? And still ask it today. They're not so much asking it today about his his ability to control nature because he did that back then and that seems to be the one time, I mean the last time when he was physically walking on the earth that he did that. But he is, they are still, people today are still asking the question, who is this man based on his Statements and our statements to people that don't know him that he can forgive sins. Who is this man that can forgive sins? So he is the, I'm going to make another statement here. Jesus Christ is the only person that ever lived that was both man and God. And he can control nature. He can forgive sins, he can heal people. No one else can do all that. So why is that important? Well, it's important because it teaches us three things, and and I just stated them. Jesus was human, he was God, and thirdly, he is all-sufficient. So how do we know he was completely human? Well, we go back to the Bible. And what we had to learn in overseas was the Bible is our basically our only reliable resource. And the Holy Spirit could in- help a person interpret it. There was where we ministered overseas, there was no system of, okay, we're gonna we're gonna incorporate you into this church. And you'll grow because you've been associated with this church and with these other Christians. If the Holy Spirit didn't teach them, and if we didn't learn teach them to go to the Bible for their for their growth, okay, it probably wasn't going to happen. Because what they were going to do is get their theology off of TV, okay, or they were going to get it from a pastor. And all it took in South Africa to become a pastor was to state you were a pastor. And you could go start a church because that was, that was a guaranteed good living for a person. And it was a really messed up system, okay? So we, we learned that the teaching had to come from the Bible and the growth of the Christian, the person who made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, had to come from the Bible through the Holy Spirit. So that's why I, this, this message is like all scripture. It's not all scripture, but you understand what I'm saying. Okay, so how do we know that he was completely human? We have to look to the source book. Okay? Uh, permit me to read John 1, 1 through 14. 
In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was already with God in the beginning. Everything came into existence through him. Not one thing that exists was made without him. He was the source of life, and that life was the light for humanity. The light shines in the dark, and the dark has never extinguished it. God sent a man named John to be his messenger. John came to declare the truth about the light that, so that everyone would become believers through his message. John was not the light, but he came to declare the truth about the light. The real light, which shines on everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into existence through him, yet the world didn't recognize him. He went to his own people, and his own people didn't accept him. However, he gave the right to become God's children to everyone who believed in him. These people didn't become God's children in a physical way, from a human impulse or from a husband's desire. They were born from God. Verse 14. The word became flesh, some, or, or human, some t translations say, and lived among us. The disciples say, we saw his glory. It was the glory that the Father shares with his only Son, a glory full of kindness and truth. So this passage of Scripture tells us that he was a human. Okay? And people saw him, touched him. Another one. This one's from Paul's writings in Galatians. But when the right time came, God sent his Son into the world. A woman gave birth to him, and he came under the control of God's laws. God sent him to pay for the freedom of those who were controlled by these laws so that we would be adopted as his children. The key of this is, is you're not human if you're not born from a woman. <laughs> okay? You, that's the way it works. That's the system. Okay? So a woman gave birth uh, to Jesus. One more. While they were in Bethlehem, this is from Luke, while they were in Bethlehem, the time came for Mary to, to have her child. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there wasn't any room for them in the inn. Now, not only do we know Jesus was born of a woman, that woman has a name. You follow me? She has a name. Her name is Mary. She was a real person, too. Okay. Consider this. In the story about the storm, you remember that? Where was Jesus? He was lying on the back on a cushion asleep. If he wasn't human, he wouldn't have needed to sleep. Humans get tired. Even Jesus had to rest. Okay? So we know that he was human. So how do we know that he was God? That's the hard part to prove. But again, we got to go to our source document and trust the Holy Spirit to teach us this. From Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether they are kings or lords, rulers or powers. Everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before everything and holds everything together. He is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, the first to come back to life so that he would have first place in everything. Listen. God was pleased to have all of himself live in Christ. That's pretty plain. He, God, I'm sorry. I get excited. God was also pleased to bring everything on earth and in heaven back to himself through Christ. He did this by making peace through Christ's blood sacrificed on the cross. The key phrase, God was pleased to have all of himself live in Christ. Another one from Colossians tells us, 
all of God lives in Christ's body. And God has made you complete in Christ if Jesus Christ is your Savior. Christ is in charge of every ruler and authority. So he's fully God, he's fully human, and I said the last one was he is all-sufficient. So how do we know that? Well, Hebrews tells us he was perfect. How many of you would own up to being perfect? No me. Jesus Christ never sinned, but at the same time, he knows our situation. He was fully human. He knew temptation. Okay? From the Bible. We need to hold on to our declaration of faith. We have a superior chief priest who has gone through the heavens. That person is Jesus, the Son of God. We have a chief priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way that we are, but he didn't sin. So we can go confidently to the throne of God's kindness to receive mercy and find kindness, which will help us at the right time. Jesus never sinned. He is our example. During his life on the earth, Jesus prayed to God who could save him from death. He prayed and pleaded with loud crying and tears. He was heard because of his devotion to God. Although Jesus was the Son of God, he learned to be obedient through his suffering. After he had finished his work, he became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. That's from Hebrews as well. And it shows that Jesus Christ suffered as a human being. Jesus is able to satisfy our needs. Jesus fed at one time over 5,000 people on one occasion and when the people came to listen to him teach about God. When the evening came and they had not eaten, they were hungry, although they had only five loaves and two fishes, Jesus used the five loaves of bread and the two fish to fight in 5,000 people. He is sufficient for whatever our need is. He was also a wise teacher. He said one time, this is from Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Jesus is more powerful than demons. There was a time when he even did that. He could cure demon-possessed people. And he raised the dead. Uh, he had a friend named Lazarus. And that friend died. And Jesus waited four days to come to be with the family. And uh, when he said, take me to the tomb, that was one thing. But when he said, open, roll back the stone, that's a whole different situation, and I, I love the, the, I think it was Martha that said, Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> but what, what did it take to get Lazarus out of the grave? It says Jesus prayed and then called at the top of his voice, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walked out of that grave, a resurrected man, Jesus acts, has power over death. He is all sufficient for us. And he loves and cares. He cares for us. He cares for people. And we have the story about the good shepherd. So he said, I'm the door to the sheep pen. And all who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep didn't listen to them. 
I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal, steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So we see from that story that Jesus loves and cares for people. Now many, many, many people at that in his day loved him. Okay. However, there were some who did not. For whatever reason, they did not. Some of the leaders were jealous of him. They caused him to be arrested. They caused him to be placed on trial and condemned and ultimately to be hung on a cross where he died. He suffered. That's the point of that. Jesus Christ suffered greatly for you and I. So he is, because of that, the perfect sacrifice. He did not deserve to die. Remember, he was perfect. He was loving. He had all the right characteristics. As a, even as a human, he had all the right ones. He did not deserve to die. But God loves us so much that he allowed Jesus to die on that cross for the forgiveness of sin in our place. Only through the shedding of blood, Jesus' blood, was God able to forgive our sin. Jesus' death demonstrates God's love toward us. However, the story doesn't end here. They took him down from that cross. And this we're coming up on that time of the year, folks. They took him down from that cross, a dead man. As a human, he died. But on that third day, he rose from the dead. The power of God resurrected him, and he lives today. And because of him, and because of who this man is, we can have that life. We can have eternal life. We can have forgiveness of sins. He meets all our needs. Whatever your situation is, whatever you've gone through, whatever you need help with, whatever it takes, he lived as we live. He knows us. Because he is because Jesus is fully God with all the attributes, character, power of God, he can forgive us and make us acceptable to him, to God. Our job, where do we fit into all this? How do we answer this question in our own heart? Who is this man? Our job is to accept he is who he is, who he says he was, who the word of God says he is, and believe it. Accept it and believe it and do what he says. So what today do you need to believe about Jesus? If there's still some sort of doubt in your life, in your heart, in your mind, is who is this guy and is, it, is this really real? Settle it. He's God. He's man. He's all-sufficient, and he wants to be your personal Savior. 